Greetings everyone, I'm Keelan, and I'm here today to discuss a particularly heart-wrenching situation. I find myself feeling exhausted, questioning how much longer this can continue, and what I'm really waiting for. My love for him was profound, a love I pledged before God when we stood together at the altar. I vowed to love him forever, and only heaven itself could part us. But now I wonder if I can retract those promises. Do I need to endure this self-inflicted torment day in and day out? I haven't loved him for a long time, just as he no longer loves me. His affections are reserved for himself, his parents, and our children. But in my moments of despair, I ask, who will love me? It often feels like even God has turned away, given the family into which I've been thrust, where I am merely remembered when they require something. The continuous demands for house chores, the incessant stomping of feet, and the feeling of captivity within this house have left me contemplating whether I should confide in Will, take the children, and leave. Yet I fear the hurdles that would arise, especially with Will's father. I hope to survive this ordeal. These entries are from Summer Inman's personal diary, her sanctuary where she could express her thoughts without fear of judgment or retribution. This was in 1983, in Logan, Ohio, a small American town with only 40,000 residents. During this time, a new evangelical church, the Tabernacle of Faith, was established, led by a charismatic preacher named David Oyedepo from Nigeria. Bill and Sandra Inman, the parents of Will, met at this church, and their connection eventually led to their marriage. They had a son named Will. As he grew older, Will, like his father, became involved in the Tabernacle of Faith. At the age of 17, he met Summer Cook, who was 15 at the time. They waited until Summer turned 18 before marrying. In 2004, after their wedding, the Inman family insisted that the young couple live with them, a decision that didn't sit well with Summer. Nevertheless, she moved into the Inman family's home. In the same year, Bill Inman had a transformative idea. He established his own congregation and converted the family garage, once used as a workshop, into a self-proclaimed church. Summer Inman's diary reveals her observations, noting how Bill Inman's religious fervor has caused him to change. He claimed to hear the voice of God in his dreams, and he wished to share these revelations with others. Will, his own son, seemed to recognize the radical transformation in his father. However, for some, like Summer, Bill Inman's vision may have appeared delusional. In 2005, Will and Summer had their first son, Alex. Yet their family was in severe financial distress. The women were not permitted to work outside the home. Instead, they were limited to domestic duties, maintaining a family with four adults and an infant solely on donations from parishioners and Will's sporadic part-time jobs proved challenging. At a family gathering, Bill announced their plans to relocate to Florida. Will took on construction work while the women continued to care for baby Alex at home. From Summer's diary, it was evident that not much changed after their move to Florida. Days passed with Will and his father disappearing for work, leaving Sandra and me to look after Alex day and night. I couldn't help but wonder when Will would mature and stand on his own. I felt impatient for that day to come. Upon realizing that they couldn't earn the substantial income they had hoped for in Florida, Bill Inman decided to return to his native state. However, due to unpaid taxes, they lost their house in Logan, and the court prohibited its repurchase. Consequently, they moved to a rented house in the rural area of Vinton, not far from Logan. It was in Vinton that Summer gave birth to two daughters, Kelly and Alana. From Summer's diary, it was evident that their financial situation remained challenging. Will expressed a desire for her to have 12 children, a notion she sometimes found laughable, which offended him and led to periods of strained communication. In 2010, Bill Inman officially became the leader of the Tabernacle of Faith Church. Together with his wife, Sandra, they established a non-profit organization called Mercy Ranch. Bill conceived the idea of building a home for orphans, widows, and the homeless on behalf of the church. However, they lacked the necessary funds. Bill devised a lottery to raise money, 
with the grand prize being $200,000 and numerous valuable prizes for the other participants. They conducted television and radio advertisements, and Bill even went door to door, inviting residents to participate in the charity lottery. Remarkably, he managed to raise $1 million. Unfortunately, the grand prize drawing, scheduled for September 2010, never took place, nor in October or November. Bill Inman had simply deceived the people who had placed their trust in him, with no intention of returning their money. During this period, Will's father hired Adam Peters to manage landscaping and household tasks on their property. Adam began to spend more time with Summer, developing a sense of sympathy for her. Unbeknownst to him, Summer and Will were facing relationship issues. Nevertheless, he persisted in showing attention to the young woman. Eventually, Summer initiated divorce proceedings, taking her children and returning to her parents' home. There, she secured a job as a bank cleaner, her first employment. Despite her limited education and work experience due to her early marriage and confinement in the Inman household, Summer didn't anticipate a high-paying job. However, she found solace in her newfound independence. For the first time in many years, she was not under anyone's thumb. Even with her resentment towards Will, she didn't mind her father seeing the children as he pleased, believing that the children needed their father and grandparents in their lives. Bill Inman, despite his overbearing demeanor, displayed great affection and care for the children. To deny this would be unwise. However, in December 2010, a bailiff arrived at the Inman house, ordering the family to vacate the premises due to unpaid rent. Summer learned of this and went to the house to collect her belongings, which she hadn't had the chance to pack when she moved in with her parents. It was a nerve-wracking experience, returning to a place where she was now considered a traitor. She contacted Adam for assistance with the packing. Upon seeing Summer arrive with her new partner, the Inman family refused to allow them inside. They hurled insults and threatened to burn Summer's belongings in the backyard. Even the police couldn't mediate the conflict as Will became aggressive, even assaulting an officer. Meanwhile, an appalled Adam shouted that he would find and harm the officer. On that very day, Summer decided to file a report against her husband. In it, she highlighted the drastic change in Will's behavior, asserting that he had assumed complete control over her life after their marriage. He monitored her calls, texts, emails, and even controlled her eating habits, shower duration, and outdoor time. He would occasionally confiscate her phone, leaving her out of touch for extended periods, even with her own parents. Furthermore, he openly admitted to wanting a second wife and had registered on dating sites, sharing intimate photos and corresponding with other women. Summer's diary often contained her desire to divorce Will, but her fear was palpable. Will had frequently warned her that if she sought a divorce, he would resort to violence. The police took a statement from a frightened Summer, who had harbored this fear for years. They returned to the Inman home for further questioning, and Will offered unconvincing explanations, such as taking her phone to prevent constant communication with her lover, or monitoring her diet for her well-being. The police found his answers dubious, issued a restraining order against him, and fined him with probation for his behavior. The Inman family, viewing this as an abuse of their son, responded with a statement of their own. In this statement, they accused Adam Peters of showing an unhealthy interest in Summer's young children while working at their home, insinuating that his presence around the children could lead to dire consequences. These allegations remained unsubstantiated. Unfortunately, the darkest chapter in Summer's life unfolded on the night of March 27, 2011. Summer was concluding her work at a Logan Bank's downtown branch. The branch had closed for the day, and she was left to tidy her workspace, dust, and dispose of the trash. She sent a message to Adam, informing him that she didn't have much time left and would soon be heading home. It was already midnight, and Summer was significantly late, an unusual occurrence for her. Adam began to grow increasingly concerned, uncertain about what Will might be involved in. When Adam arrived at the ward, he noticed that the doors were locked, with no lights illuminating the windows, indicating that Summer wasn't inside. He circled the building but found no signs of her, 
Desperate to find her, he made his way to the dumpsters, where he discovered Summer's belongings, including her purse, cell phone, and her red jacket scattered near the bins. There was no time to waste, and he immediately dialed the police. The police arrived and examined Summer's belongings. They then approached the bank and interviewed the security guards, who mentioned that Summer had left over an hour ago and hadn't returned. Under the police car's lights, three individuals came forward, revealing themselves as witnesses to the kidnapping. Two women had been out for an evening jog, and even in the darkness, they observed a white Ford pulling up to the bank cleaner's house. Two men wearing black masks forcibly pushed a screaming woman into the back seat. As the woman cried for help, another witness attempted to intervene, but the driver, a blonde woman, sprayed him in the face with a canister, causing him to fall to the ground. The car with the kidnappers then sped away. The women, lacking phones, rushed to the nearest police station and emotionally relayed the traumatic event they had witnessed. Initially, the police officers on duty dismissed their account, assuming it was a fabricated story. However, it soon became evident that the witness's story was indeed the truth. Due to the initial delay in taking action by the police, finding Summer based on this lead was now a challenging task. As mentioned earlier, Logan was a small town. Consequently, News of Summer's abduction by three unidentified men quickly circulated through the community overnight. By morning, proactive citizens had formed search groups to locate the missing woman. They meticulously combed through parks, vacant lots, and abandoned warehouses. Yet Summer remained elusive. A week prior to her disappearance, Will Inman had attempted to contest his child support payments. According to the court order, he was required to pay $150 for each child. Given his monthly salary of only $500, he had requested a reduction to $150 for all three children combined. He also sought full custody of his children. However, the court had denied this request since Summer had remained isolated and out of contact with anyone for an extended period. The police focused their suspicions on the Inman family. They were discovered in the residence of Bill's mother in a nearby town. All three family members claimed they had no knowledge of Summer's disappearance. They asserted that on the day of the kidnapping, they were in Cleveland intending to find a new home. However, their car broke down during the journey and they decided to return to Logan, concerned about being stranded on a deserted highway until morning. Additionally, their long-standing animosity towards Adam resurfaced, leading them to shift blame onto him. Although the car breakdown could neither be confirmed nor refuted, a white Ford matching the description provided by the kidnapping witnesses was spotted in their yard during the police interrogation. Upon inspecting the vehicle, a GPS receiver was found to have been turned off during the period of Summer's abduction. The police also examined the Inman family's cell phones, revealing that they had not left Logan on the night in question. Subsequently, additional information emerged indicating that at 7.30 a.m. on the morning of Summer's disappearance, the white Ford had been brought to a car wash, where all three family members, Bill, Sandra, and Will, were cleaning the interior. The entire family was detained and subjected to questioning. Bill, while being led away by the police, vehemently asserted their innocence, attributing the situation to the devil, whom he claimed to be combating alongside his congregation. At the police station, the Inman family repeatedly reiterated the same narrative. However, as it became evident that they lacked an alibi and were facing serious charges, Sandra eventually admitted her involvement. In her testimony, she confessed to orchestrating the kidnapping. She acknowledged that the idea was hers, and she was the one driving the white Ford that night. She insisted that they had not planned to kill Summer and that her death was an accident. Sandra further explained, that on the night of March 22nd, they had observed Summer near the bank where she worked, waiting for her shift to end at around 11 p.m. They approached her, with Bill and Will concealing their faces behind black masks, and forcefully placed her in the car. Their primary intention had been to persuade Summer to allow them to see the children, given their familial connection. In a moment of fear, Will had tied Summer's hands and feet with plastic ties to prevent her from escaping. Tragically, one of the ties had been fastened around her neck, 
and when he attempted to release it, it was too late, resulting in Summer's accidental death. Sandra Inman disclosed the location where they had concealed Summer's body, an old well near the Tabernacle of Faith Church, the same church where Bill and Sandra had initially met and where Will and Summer had married, had been a place of worship and confession for years. Subsequent autopsy results confirmed Sandra's statements, revealing that Summer had indeed died due to asphyxiation with no other injuries found on her body. This devastating incident took place in 2012. The court handed down life sentences to Bill Inman and Will Inman, and Sandra Inman, despite taking sole responsibility, also received a life sentence. However, the court granted her the opportunity to seek parole after 15 years. This decision seemed rooted in the family dynamics. According to relatives, decisions in the Inman family were solely made by Bill. If there was a cruel plan to regain custody of the children, it was his, and Sandra took the blame to protect her husband and son. Unfortunately, her efforts to save them failed. Thank you for following along, everyone. Please subscribe to the channel. There are many more shocking stories to come. In 1983, in Logan, Ohio, a small town of 40,000 people, a new evangelical church named Tabernacle of Faith emerged. Its charismatic founder, David Oyadipo, claimed to have received a divine message, compelling him to liberate the world from the devil's oppression through preaching and prayer. This church gained immense popularity in Logan, drawing in congregants like Bill and Sandra Inman. Bill, already a talented musician at 18, and Sandra, attending with her parents, eventually fell in love. They later had a son, Will, who following family tradition was introduced to church life early on. When he was 17, he met Summer Cook, a 15-year-old fellow parishioner. They patiently waited until Summer turned 18 before getting married. After their wedding in 2004, the Inman family insisted that the young couple live with them. Summer, unhappy with this arrangement, complied due to Will's dependence on his father. Despite her reservations, she moved into the Inman family home. In 2010, the family's life took a sinister turn. A grave incident occurred involving the abduction of Summer Inman, an event that shocked the small community of Logan. The Inman family was suspected of being involved, leading to a court trial where Bill and Will Inman were sentenced to life imprisonment. Sandra, taking the blame to shield her family, also received a life sentence, with the possibility of parole after 15 years. This twist in the family's fate revealed deep-seated tensions and a tragic web of deception. Bill embarked on a new journey, establishing his own congregation and transforming the family garage, previously a workshop, into a makeshift church. In the pages of Summer Inman's diary, a drastic change in Will's father is evident. He seemed like a completely different person. At a family dinner, he disclosed that he heard the voice of God in his dreams and felt compelled to share this revelation for the greater good. Even Will appeared to acknowledge the transformation in his father, though he couldn't voice his concerns against it. To some, like Summer, Bill Inman's vision might have seemed far-fetched, but locals flocked to their garage, praying and attentively listening to their leader's speeches. They even made generous donations. In 2005, Will and Summer welcomed their first child, Alex. However, shortly after the baby's arrival, it became apparent that their family was facing substantial financial difficulties. The women were prohibited from seeking employment and were relegated to household chores, relying solely on donations from parishioners and Will's infrequent part-time work proved insufficient for four adults and a newborn child to make ends meet. Facing these financial hardships, Bill Inman made a pivotal decision to relocate to Florida, where both Bill and Will engaged in construction work, while the women continued to look after baby Alex. However, the move didn't bring substantial changes to their daily routine. Will and his father were away at work for the majority of the day, leaving Sandra and Summer responsible for Alex. As time passed, Will's father, recognizing the financial challenges in Florida, chose to return to their home state. Unfortunately, due to unpaid taxes, their house in Logan was seized and the court imposed restrictions on its redemption. Consequently, they relocated to a rented countryside house in Vinton, not far from Logan. 
It was in Vinton that Summer gave birth to their two daughters, Kelly and Alana. Despite their ongoing financial struggles, Will expressed his desire for Summer to have 12 children. Her laughter at this notion offended him, occasionally leading to periods of silence in their relationship. In 2010, Bill Inman officially assumed the leadership of the Tabernacle of Faith Church. Together with his wife, Sandra, they established a non-profit organization called Mercy Ranch. Bill conceived a grand plan to build a home for orphans, widows, and the homeless on behalf of the church. While the idea lacked funding, Bill devised a solution. He introduced a lottery. The grand prize was $200,000, with the remaining 99 participants receiving valuable prizes. The collected funds would be allocated towards constructing the house of Bill's dreams. Television and radio ads promoted the charity lottery, and Bill personally went door to door, urging residents to participate. This campaign resulted in Bill Inman raising an astonishing $1 million. The grand prize drawing was scheduled for September 2010, but as anticipated, no drawing occurred in September, October, or November. Bill Inman, it turned out, had deceived those who had placed their trust in him with no intention of returning the money. During this period, Will's father hired Adam Peters to manage landscaping and other household tasks on their property. Adam spent considerable time with Summer and began to feel a growing affinity for her. Unbeknownst to him, Summer and Will were experiencing difficulties in their relationship. Nonetheless, Adam persisted in demonstrating his interest in the young woman. After some time, Summer decided to file for divorce, taking the children with her to her parents' home. It marked the first time she secured employment, working as a bank cleaner. While her marriage and prolonged confinement in the Inman household had left her without education or work experience, she felt a sense of newfound independence, free from external constraints. Despite her grievances against Will, she didn't object to her father spending time with the children, believing that the kids needed their father's presence as much as they required their grandparents. It was worth noting that despite Bill Inman's tyrannical disposition, he displayed a warm and caring attitude toward the children. In December 2010, a bailiff arrived at the Inman residence ordering the family to vacate due to unpaid rent. Summer learned of this development and despite feeling like a traitor, went to the house to collect her belongings. She reached out to Adam for assistance as the situation was intimidating and difficult for her to handle alone. Upon seeing that Summer arrived with her new partner, the Inman family vehemently refused entry, hurling a barrage of curses and threats at them. They even promised to burn all of Summer's belongings that remained inside the house. The situation escalated to the extent that even the presence of the police couldn't mediate the conflict. Will, in particular, became physically aggressive, going as far as assaulting a police officer. Meanwhile, an astonished Adam shouted threats, vowing to find and harm Will. On that fateful day, Summer decided to file a report against her husband, detailing the changes in his behavior and control over her. She outlined how, post-marriage, he had become increasingly domineering, governing her communications, meals, shower time, and outdoor activities. Periodically, he confiscated her phone, leaving her out of touch for weeks, even with her own parents. Furthermore, he openly admitted to his intention of seeking a second wife and actively registered on dating websites, sharing intimate photos and exchanging messages with other women. Summer's diary often contained entries expressing her desire to divorce Will, although her fear of him was understandable, given his numerous threats to harm her. The police received a statement from the terrified Summer who had long lived in fear and subsequently visited the Inman residence. When questioned, Will admitted to confiscating his wife's phone, justifying it as an attempt to prevent her constant contact with her lover. He also acknowledged monitoring her diet, but claimed it was driven by concern for her health. However, his explanations failed to convince the police, who forbade him from approaching his ex-wife. Additionally, he received fines and probation for his behavior. The Inman family, viewing Will's restrictions as excessive, couldn't ignore what they perceived as the abuse of their son. 
they countered with their own statement. Interestingly, they turned their allegations toward Adam Peters, contending that during his work in their household, he displayed a troubling interest in Summer's young children. They went further to suggest that Adam's subsequent presence around the children could lead to dangerous consequences. However, their claims were not substantiated. Then, close to midnight on March 22, 2011, a significant tragedy occurred in Summer's life. She was concluding her work at the bank, located in the heart of Logan, which had already closed for the day. All that remained was some routine tidying up, dusting and taking out the trash. Summer sent a text message to Adam, notifying him that she was nearly done and would be heading home soon. By 12 o'clock at night, Summer was notably late, an unusual occurrence for her. Adam grew increasingly concerned, uncertain of what Will might be up to. Adam made the decision to seek out Summer. However, upon reaching the bank, he noticed that the doors were locked and no lights illuminated the windows, indicating that Summer was absent. Adam roamed the premises but found no sign of her. He proceeded to the area with the dumpsters, where Summer would typically dispose of accumulated trash bags throughout the day. Yet even there, she was nowhere to be found. Nearby, he came across Summer's belongings, her purse, cell phone, and her red jacket, which lay in the grass. Slightly further from her possessions, there was no time for hesitation. Adam promptly dialed the police's phone number. Law enforcement officers arrived and conducted a thorough inspection of the belongings. They also knocked on the bank's doors, interviewing the security personnel. The security personnel confirmed that Summer had left for home over an hour ago, and they hadn't seen her since. At that point, illuminated by the police car's lights, three individuals approached. It became apparent that these individuals were eyewitnesses to the kidnapping. Two women had been out for an evening jog, even though it was already dark. They described how a white Ford pulled up to the bank, close to the cleaner's workplace. Two masked men emerged from the vehicle and forcefully pushed a screaming woman into the back seat. The woman's screams attracted the attention of another eyewitness who rushed to aid her. However, a blonde woman in the driver's seat incapacitated the well-intentioned individual by spraying him with a noxious gas. This rendered him incapacitated, and the car, with the kidnappers and Summer, sped away. It's worth noting that the two joggers lacked mobile phones, so they hastened to the nearest police station. Overwhelmed and emotional, the eyewitnesses rushed into the station, recounting their shocking experience. Initially, the police officers on duty dismissed their account, naively believing it to be a fabricated story. After all, who would consider kidnapping a bank cleaner carrying garbage bags? As it turned out, however, the story was indeed factual. Due to the sluggish response of the, the Inman family, including Bill, Sandra, and Will, claimed they had no knowledge of Summer's disappearance and kidnapping. On the day of the kidnapping, they asserted they were in Cleveland, intending to search for a new home. Unfortunately, their car broke down on the way and fearing they might be stranded on a deserted highway until morning, they returned to Logan. Their past grudge against Adam resurfaced, leading them to blame him for the unfortunate turn of events. The car breakdown remained unverified during police investigations. However, during their inquiry, authorities identified a white Ford in the Inman family's yard, consistent with the description provided by witnesses of the kidnapping. Suspicion arose when the police discovered that the car's GPS receiver had been turned off during the period of Summer's abduction. The police decided to examine the Inman family's cell phones, which revealed that the family had not left Logan on the night in question. Additionally, law enforcement received information that at 7.30 a.m. on the morning of Summer's disappearance, the white Ford had been at a car wash. Bill, Sandra, and Will were observed cleaning the interior. Subsequently, the entire family was apprehended and subjected to questioning. During this time, Bill, while being led away by the police, vehemently protested their innocence, attributing the ordeal to the work of the devil, against whom he and his fellow parishioners were combating. At the police station, the Inman family repeatedly reiterated their version of events until it became evident they had no alibi and were confronting serious consequences. 
It was then that Sandra Inman assumed responsibility for the kidnapping. According to her testimony, the decision to abduct Summer was her idea, and she was driving the white Ford that night. She asserted that neither she nor her family had intended to kill Summer, emphasis saying it was an accident. On the night of March 22, they had parked near the bank where Summer worked, waiting for her to conclude her shift. Around 11 p.m., they spotted her close to the garbage cans near the bank. Sandra approached her in the car, while Bill and Will, concealed behind black masks, coerced her into the vehicle. Their sole intention was to convince Summer to allow them to see the children, as they considered themselves family. In an attempt to intimidate her, Will bound Summer's hands and feet with plastic ties to prevent her from fleeing. Regrettably, he overestimated his strength and unintentionally tightened one of the ties around her neck. This resulted in Summer choking and her face turning red. Will tried to locate a knife to cut the tie, but it was futile, and he found it too late. Tragically, Summer died in the course of these events. Sandra Inman disclosed the location where they had concealed Summer's body, an old well near the Tabernacle of Faith Church. This was the same church where Bill and Sandra initially met and where Will and Summer subsequently married. They had also frequented the church for years to pray and confess. The autopsy affirmed Sandra's account, confirming that Summer had indeed died due to asphyxiation. No other injuries were detected on her body. In 2012, the court delivered its verdict, sentencing Bill and Will Inman to life in prison for their involvement in Summer's abduction and death. Sandra Inman, despite assuming all the blame, also received a life sentence. However, the court allowed her to request parole after 15 years. This decision was apparently based on the belief that the women in the Inman family were not decision makers and obediently followed Bill's lead. If the sinister plan to regain custody of the children existed, it was perceived as Bill's doing, and Sandra took the blame in an attempt to protect her husband and son.